Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight and bless your name. We glorify you. We thank you for your good people here. Thank you for the great work that has been done here. Lord, we pray you establish your people more and more in Jesus' name. All our brothers, our leaders, all our sisters, our leaders, all our youths, everyone, Lord, present here today, I pray you empower everyone in Jesus' name. Enlighten your people. Strengthen your people. Energize us today. Empower the leadership. I will pray, Lord, that we will take this whole land. We will evangelize this land. I will pray, Lord, that nobody will escape the arrow of the gospel in this land in Jesus' name. Tonight, speak to us. Wake us up. Stir us up. And help us to reach forth once again and do this work you have committed into our hands. I thank you because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you and God bless you. You can sit down. I'm talking to you tonight on evangelism. Evangelism. And actually the topic is the evangelist's ministry in the world. The evangelist's ministry in the world. Let's look at Mark chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 15. Mark chapter 16 verse 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's how we started here. That's how we need to continue. The same weapon that started at that time. And the same understanding that such at that time, and the same zeal that such at that time, and the same power, zeal at that time, that's the same thing we ought to have today. That word go must never leave your life. That word go must never leave you alone because Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to how many people there? every creature. And then he says, see that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. I have believers in the house there today. And because you believe and you are baptized, it says you will be saved. And it says those who do not believe will be damned. We're looking at John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and I'm reading from verse 16. John chapter 17 and we're looking at it from verse 16. Here is what it says. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. There are many people that that's where they stop. We're not of the world because Jesus is not of the world. And they knock worldliness and they preach against worldliness. And all they do in their small circle, in their small membership, that's what they do. We're not of the world. And they are so segregated and so separated from the world, they do not have any impact and any influence on the world. Look at verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And that's where other people stop. Thank God we're born again. I say, thank God I'm born again. And then thank God we're sanctified. Thank God I'm sanctified. And you see, there are people, sanctified believers, and they're sanctified and secluded. They're sanctified and locked up. They're sanctified and confined. They're sanctified and they remain in just a little house fellowship in their little church building. Look at verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent you, have I also sent them into the world. We must continue until we understand. The reason we are saved is to go and save others. And the reason we are born is to reproduce. And the reason we come into the kingdom is to reach out and bring other people into the kingdom. As thou hast sent me. Into the world. Even so, have I also sent them into the world. It's talking about all his disciples. It's talking about all believers. It's talking about all the people that are washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's talking about everyone that has tasted the grace of God and the goodness of God. And he said, I brought them out of the world. That's not only apostles. I brought them out of the world. That's not only the men. I brought them out of the world. It's talking about the men and the women. The believers all all together and he said I brought them out that I may send them forth send them into the world so that they will do the work I came to do over here and this is what happened in the early church Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, and I'm reading here from verse 4. It says, therefore, they that was scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? They were preaching the gospel. They were preaching the word. That's how the church expanded. That's how the church grew. That's how the church multiplied. Look at the effect. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem. Multiplication is going to take place here. More people coming to the kingdom. More believers being born into the kingdom. And more disciples being made even in this land in Jesus name. We're going to reach every tribe. We're going to reach every local government. We're going to reach every community until there will be no house where there's not a member of this church. You knock on this house, they say, oh, we know your member is here, come and see him. And then your member is here, come and see her. Every house will have the gospel. Every house will have the believer. It is when we understand how we did it in the early days and we know how we're going to do it now and the same fire that was in them at that time and the same zeal, the same passion in us at that time, that fire is coming back. You know, some people say revival is coming. There's no revival without evangelism. You cannot say you have revival if only the, re the those of us who are here, we are fired up and then we go around and we say praise the Lord. We do Jericho mark and Jericho march and then we say we are casting out devils. Where are you casting out devils from? The people who are outside, you reach out to them, cast the devil out of them. They repent of their sins. They are born again and more people are coming to the kingdom. When the church is growing, that is revival. I said that is revival. And that revival that has started here will never stop in Jesus' name. And the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests also were obedient to the faith. Even those who are idol worshippers, they are going to be converted. The priests are going to be converted. The false prophets are going to be converted. And all those uh, white government people, candle burning, incense burning people, the gospel is coming to them. And a great stirring up is going to happen everywhere. And many people will come to know the Lord in Jesus' name. But you know, it is when we take that gospel and we understand why Jesus Christ has left us here on earth and he says that the Father has sent me the Savior, even so have I sent them into the world. And we know that we have a ministry, we have a message, and we have a mission to give to the world. And then we carry out that ministry and we speak out that message and we carry out to fulfill that mission. That's when this thing we're talking about, the expansion of the kingdom, the establishment of the kingdom, the exaltation of our king. That's when it will take place. It will take place in our midst here in Jesus' name. We're looking at this, the evangelist's ministry in the world. Did you notice that? It's not the evangelist's ministry in the church. Uh -uh. The world, going into all the world. The evangelist's ministry is in the world. The soul winner's ministry is in the world. We're taking the gospel out of this place and we're reaching the people where the sinners are and we're giving the gospel unto them. The evangelist ministry in the world. There are three things we're going to talk about. Number one, the irreplaceable ministry of a steadfast evangelist. The irreplaceable ministry of a steadfast evangelist. So start with number one should be a steadfast evangelist. An evangelist that's still a soul winner and is a brother and a sister is not the title, it's the function. It's not the title, it's the role, it's the responsibility, it's the duty. The evangelist, the one that is taking the evangel, the gospel, the message of salvation, is taking it out there to the world and is steadfast about it. 
rainy season is steadfast. Dry season is steadfast. And when things are tough, it's steadfast. When things are easy, it's steadfast. When people are complaining about the economy, it's steadfast. When there's no transportation, it's steadfast. Whatever is happening in his community, he is an evangelist, he is a soul winner, and he knows that as long as there's a sinner to be spoken to, we cannot, uh, we cannot allow the rain, we cannot allow the storm, we cannot allow anything to hinder us. We must reach out. That's a steadfast past evangelist and then the irreplaceable ministry you see what some people have done they have replaced the ministry of the soul winner with a lot of things i say brother do you evangelize oh no pastor i've replaced evangelism with sweeping i sweep the church i said is that so i say sister are you an evangelist are you a soul winner oh no pastor you know pastor i am now in the choir i said so we have replaced evangelism with everything i say my young man there are you are you an evangelist are you a soul winner oh no now i lead house fellowship we have taken this or this or this in the church to replace the evangelist to the world. Whatever you do in the church will not reach those people. We need to go out and reach them. And what Jesus said is not that we sit in the church and do this and do this and do that. All those things are good. That's between you and I. That's what ministers to you or to me. But we're talking about the people who are outside there in the world. And he said, go ye out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Well, follow them. The people on the go, the people on the move, the people who are taking the gospel out of this place and taking it out to the world, those are the people the signs will follow. The signs will follow me. Because I will be going. You take the gospel from where you are, you go to the world and you reach out to them and this gospel will be effective in your mouth in Jesus name. We're talking about the irreplaceable ministry. A ministry we don't replace by any other thing. A ministry we don't replace by, I have a duty here, I have a responsibility, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. No, not at all. The irreplaceable ministry of a steadfast evangelist. Number two, the irrevocable message of a single-minded evangelist. Irrevocable. That means unalterable. That means unchangeable. That means it's, something, it's not something you pull back. That message is there. And from the time Jesus gave out that message until the last soul will be born again, that message is irrevocable. The irrevocable message of a single-minded evangelist. And then number three now is the irreproachable model. The irreproachable models for soul winning evangelists. You see the evangelists we are talking about, they're not the fruitless soul winners. The evangelists we are talking about, they're not the unproductive evangelists. They're the people that are actually winning souls. They're, they're actually investing souls into the kingdom. And you look at their ministry. They are models who cannot have any reproach on the irreproachable models of Soul winning evangel. Tell me number one over there. The irreplaceable ministry of steadfast evangelists. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four. I'm reading to you from uh, from verse five. Second Timothy chapter four, and we're reading from verse five. It says in verse five, it says, "But watch thou in all things." Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of that ministry. You'll find here Paul, the apostle, talking to Timothy. And he was telling uh, Timothy, you see, Timothy was uh, a timid personality. Timothy was a person you can easily frighten. Timothy was a person you can easily intimidate and make afraid. The frown of a sinner could easily make Timothy afraid. The pranks of backsliders can easily make Timothy afraid. And all the opposition and resistance of idol worshippers can easily make a Timothy afraid. You know, in the community in which we're living, the masquerades may make you afraid and the idol worshippers may 
can make you afraid. Your cultic people can make you afraid. And all the sinners can make you afraid. But in spite of that fear, Paul the apostle called upon Timothy. said, Timothy, what are you doing? You have a duty. And a fearful person cannot do that duty. And you have a responsibility. If you are timid and fearful and you are backward and you are reserved and you are retarded and you cannot go out and reach out, you never reach anybody. But from today, you will reach somebody. Yeah. I said you will reach somebody. Yeah. You throw your fears to the wind. And you say, here is what the Lord has called me to do. As a man, as a woman, as a soul winner, as an evangelist, as a pastor, as a teacher, as a preacher. He has called you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If you don't do it, the people will perish. They will spend eternity in hell, fire forever and ever. And then he says, their blood will I require at your hand. That's why, throw your fears away. And then it says in that verse, you look at chapter 1, chapter 1 of Second Timothy, verse 7. For God has not given us, tell me. For God has not given to us, tell me. Now you are going to make it personally. One, two, three, go. For God has not given me the spirit of fear. You know, I look at my little boy. When that, little, when that boy was little, I said, that thing in your I didn't give you that thing. Where did you get that thing? Mommy, you look at your daughter and she's having some biscuits. You say, where did you get that? I didn't give you biscuits. You look at, you know, your daughter is wearing a particular dress. Come on here. Where did you get this? I didn't give you this. Where did you get it? And that's what the Lord is asking you. I didn't give you the spirit of fear. Where did you get it? Who gave you? How did you get this one? Don't you know that I told you if a stranger gives you any biscuit, don't take it. If a stranger gives you granules, don't take it. If a stranger gives you anything, don't take it. How is it, Mama and Papa? The one that tells little children, a stranger gives you something, don't get. And then you are the one that takes on the spirit of fear. Throw it back. I said, throw it back. The Father did not give that to you. The Savior did not give that to you. The Lord did not give that to you. Wherever it came from, send it back to the sender. I said, send it back to the sender. And the courage of the Lord and the strength of the Lord and the power of the Lord is coming upon you today in Jesus' name. He says, I give unto you power. To tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by enemies hurt you. I did an amen there. For God has not, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's why I told Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. Chapter 4 verse 5. It says, watch thou in all things and endure affliction. Do the work. Of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. What's the work of an evangelist? How do you know an evangelist? When an evangelist is in operation. When an evangelist is in the ministry. When an evangelist is doing something. And you know that this is the work of the evangelist. How do you recognize him? You recognize him by the word go and by the word preach. By the word go and by the word preach. He is going. Going into all the world. And preach and is preaching. When you see somebody, it's not just it's not just a one of the words go. A person may go and trade. A person may go and play. A person may go and gamble. A person may go and just waste his life and waste his time. That's not evangelism. A person may preach. He may stay in our locality here and preach. That's not evangelism. He may be talking to the same people all the time. He's preaching, but that's not evangelism. It's when you do those two things together. Go, preach. Go, preach. And you join everything together. You go to the market and preach. You go to the school and preach. You go to the college and preach. You go to your community and preach. You go to the village and preach. You go to where those people are gathering and you preach. That's the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Look at this. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 10. We're reading from verse 7. We're looking for those two words to go and to preach. To go and to preach. Matthew chapter 10. And we read here from verse 7. Matthew chapter 10. We're reading from verse 7. It says, as she go, tell me the next word, preach. 
as he go preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we're looking at Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. We're looking for those two words because it's those two words coming together, those two active words, action words, verbs. Those words that make up the work of the soul winner. Look at Jonah chapter 3 verse 2. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and tell me the next word. Preach. Preach unto it. The preaching that I bid thee is going and is preaching. He has to go and he has to preach. And when those two words come together, that's evangelism. That means you are going as an evangelist. That means you are going as a soul winner. You are preaching the gospel to every creature. Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, we're reading from verse 38. Mark chapter 1, verse 38. Uh, let's, let's look at it from verse 36. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And, and when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. Let's stay here and preach. That's not evangelism. All men seek for thee and they are coming to your location and you stay there. And you know, every Monday you are there, every Tuesday you are there, Wednesday you are there, Saturday you are there, every time you are there. That's not evangelism. And that's why it says now in verse 38, and he said unto them, let us go. Give me that word again. Let us go. Say it out loud. Let us go. Let us go. It says, let us go unto the next towns. We must go to the next town. We must go to the next village. We must go to the next community. We must go to that next school there. We must go to that college there. We must go to the next place. Let us go to the next towns. And what do we do there? That I may preach. That's it. Just going alone does not make evangelism. You must go and you must preach. As you are going, you are preaching. And you are not staying in the same place. You are moving from this place to that place to that place. And you are preaching the gospel unto them. Then it says, for therefore came I forth. Therefore came I forth. We are looking at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I am reading from verse 16. In Luke chapter 9 verse 16. Look at what it says. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and do what? And preach the kingdom of God. You see that those two words must come together. Before we say, that's an evangelist, that's a soul winner, that's a person that's occupied like Christ, is bringing the sinner sin, and is going all the places, and is going everywhere, and is preaching the gospel. What's the past tense of go? went. What's the past tense of preach? Preached. Now, if you look at that word went and you look at the word preach, you see they also come together. Go and preach. They went and they preach. We're looking at um, we're looking at Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 and I'm reading from verse 12. Mark chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 12, it says, And they went out, and what did they do? And preached that men should repent. If they did it, why are we not going to do it? If they were faithful, why are we not going to be faithful? If they were not just stay static in one place, and they went, and they went, and they went, why are we not going? We must go. They went and they preached that men should repent. Mark chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 20. They went and they preached. They went and they preached. Mark chapter 16, we're looking at verse 20. And they went forth. We're going forth and preached everywhere the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs for them. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. That's what they did and that's how they did it and that's how we are going to do it. The two verbs coming together in your life. That it's not just a church. You see, if you're not going, you're, you know, I'm an established Christian. I'm a sitting Christian. I'm a confined Christian. I'm a church man. Our church knows me. I'm always there on Sunday. You're not going. You're not going. There's something missing in your life. 
You're missing the excitement of souls getting converted. You're missing the joy of angels rejoicing because a sinner through you has come into the kingdom. You're missing the excitement of tasting and knowing the power of Christ flowing through you and flowing through to the people, healing the sick and delivering their prayers and getting them totally, totally delivered. Go, and then you are going to experience a new power in your life. It will come in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you go, don't shut your mouth. Open your mouth and tell somebody something. You are in that bus. Tell them something. You are in the taxi. Tell them something. You are at the train station there. Tell them something. You are, you are waiting for the boat. You want to cross over the sea. Tell them something. Anywhere you find people, go and preach and tell them that Jesus Christ died for sinners. And whosoever will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And God will use your ministry in Jesus' name. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 5. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 5. I was still talk, uh, talking about going and preaching. They went and they preached. They went and they preached. And Philip went and Philip preached. And I go and I'm going to preach. I said, I go, I'm going to preach. Look at uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 and verse 7. Uh, I'm reading verse 5. Then Philip went down to Samaria, unto the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And preached Christ unto them. I'm looking at somebody that will do that. I said, I'm looking at somebody that will do that. The Lord bless you. And the Lord prosper this work in your hand. And through you, the Lord bring multitude, multitudes, million into the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. And you know, when you serve the Lord like that, it's going to bless you. I said it's going to bless you. If you're sick while you're healing other people, he'll be healing you. If you're tormented or oppressed while you're delivering other people, without even praying for you, he will deliver you in Jesus' name. If your children have any problem at all, when you're helping other people's children, it will help your own children. Because it is what you sow that you will reap. People think that uh, we're talking about money, sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. They say, I sow money, I'm expecting, of course you expect, you know, but when you sow the gospel, you're going to reap the gospel. When you sow salvation, the salvation is going to come to your family. While you are talking to somebody else's family, somebody will be talking to your family. While you are bringing somebody or the outside there into the kingdom of God, somebody somewhere is talking to members of your family, your papa, your mama, your brothers, your sisters, will bring them into the kingdom in Jesus' name. From today, blessings will never stop in your life. As you go, as you go, as you go and you preach and you preach and you preach, something is happening outside there and inside that temple, inside that body, something is happening. You'll be so joyful, you'll say, I didn't even pray for it and it came. I didn't pray for this and it came. I didn't pray for this and it came. That's how it works because when you seek for the kingdom of God and its righteousness, all these other things will be added unto unto you. We're coming to point number two. What's your point number two there? The irrevocable message of a single-minded evangelist. Irrevocable, I told you, means unalterable. It's, it's a message that cannot be altered. It's a message that cannot be changed. It is the same gospel of that time that saved sinners in those days, that same gospel is the one still saving sinners today, making people to repent, making people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're reading from verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, and then it says, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by the which also ye are saved. You see, when you preach the right gospel, the true gospel, and the faithful gospel, and you do that faithfully, people are going to be saved. Just as somebody prayed to you and you were saved, you are going to pray to another, and that person is going to be saved in Jesus' name. And then it goes on in verse 3, it says, for I delivered unto you. First of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's the first point. Christ died for our sins. Christ 
died for sins. Without the death of Jesus, without the death of our substitute, there's no salvation. And so the message of the evangelist is not complete. We must talk about the death of Christ, the blood of Christ, the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus Christ that now replaces the sinner. And because the sinner's judgment has been placed on Christ, that's why they will not die anymore. That's why they will be saved. Look at the next verse there. And then it goes on to say, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. We're talking about the death of Christ and the burial of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. That's what brings the salvation to those people. Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, if people are going to be saved, see what happens here. Romans chapter 10, I'm reading from verses 9 and 10. It says in verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Tell me what happens. Thou shall be saved. You believe in your heart. If you're going to believe that in their heart, you must tell them, you must tell them that they don't have to perish, they don't have to die for their sins, that Christ died for them already. Whatever you say, whatever stories you tell, whatever illustrations you give, this must come into the message. That Christ has taken their place. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But so that they will not die, so that they will not perish, somebody else died for them. The perfect one, the sinless one, the spotless one, the one that committed no sin, the one that was not guilty of any sin, whatever, the one that was perfect, he died for them so that they will not die. They must believe that. And that Jesus rose again on the third day for their justification. Look at that verse 9 again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto, unto what? salvation. That's what you are after. Healing is good. That's not the end. Deliverance is good. That's not the end. But salvation, that their sins are forgiven. Their lives are transformed. If any man be in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold all things have become new. That's the message we're bringing to them. We're looking at uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and I'm reading here from verse 45. Luke Chapter 24, verse 45. Then open he their understanding. Wonderful. That, that's what you go to do. You're talking to the sinners. Uh, the, the sinners are all they're blind spiritually. They're in darkness spiritually. They don't have any knowledge of salvation spiritually. And now you go there to open their eyes of understanding. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. The third day, you see that? That's part of the message of salvation. He suffered, he died, he bore your guilt, he bore your pain, he bore your punishment, and everything was laid on Christ, paid it all. And now because he paid it all, he died. Now he rose again. Look at the 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem that all everybody to be saved now they need to repent turn away from their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they will be saved Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 Acts chapter 17, we must preach repentance. It is not just that, you know, God will bless you and God will heal you. Yes, God will. He will heal them. He will bless them. He will deliver them. He will destroy the works of the devil. But you must repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation to come unto them. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 verse 30. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God went at. But now commandeth how many people? Commandeth how many people? All men, how many places? Everywhere to do what? 
you see that that's for to repent. It's not okay, and they may repent in Lagos, but over here in Badagri, what they need is encouragement everywhere to repent. They may repent in Africa, but you know, America, they are nice, nice people. They are just to raise up their hands and say, Yes, I believe, I believe. Everybody, everywhere. He commands all men everywhere to do what? To repent. Why? Because of the start. What? Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge. How many people is he going to judge? He's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has appointed, he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. He raised him from the dead. That's the assurance he has given all men. That's why everyone, everywhere ought to repent. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 20. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. We're looking at verse 20. It tells us in verse 20, and how I cared back nothing that was profitable unto you, and I've showed you, and I've taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Number one, tell me, repentance toward God. Number two, tell me, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the complete gospel. That they must repent of their sins, turn away from their sins, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they will be saved. Acts chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 26, and we're reading from verse 18. It tells us in verse 18 to open their eyes. We need to open the eyes of the sinners. Many of the sinners do not know that what they are doing is sinful. We are to tell them, we are to show them in the scriptures that God commands us not to do this. And when we do what God has commanded not to do, that's sin. And we need to repent of that. If we're going to reconcile with God, if we're going to truly repent, we're turn away from everything that is evil and then we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who is able to change us to convert us to transform our lives that's why it says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness unto light and then and from the power of Satan unto God what to tell them to forsake and abandon their occultism and to forsake their idol worship and to forsake the powers of darkness and to throw away all those regalias of idolatry of masquerade or whatever because we're to turn them from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, that is in Christ. It was Christ talking to Paul the apostle and he says that that is what we are to preach. And who are we to preach to? Every creature, every creature. The Lord is not willing that anybody should perish. That's why if there is a neighbor you have never spoken to, why have you not spoken to them? You want them to perish? If there is a schoolmate you have not spoken to, why have you not spoken to him or to her? You want her to perish? If there is a fellow teacher you have not spoken to, why have you not spoken to him? You want him to perish? God wants everybody saved. They say, but you know, I know him. He will not accept. How do you know he will not accept? Look at Saul of Tarsus. You would have thought he will never be saved, but he got saved. He got saved. That friend of yours will get saved. That relative will get saved. Tell them, do your duty. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and the Lord will back up the word in your mouth in Jesus' name. In Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards what? Not willing that, tell me, not willing that, but that all shall come to repentance. Look up here for a moment. Do you know there are some people that say, the people will be saved. God already has elected them, has predestinated them. And the majority of the people, he doesn't want them to be saved. Because heaven is too small in their understanding. That if too many people get saved, there'll be no, there'll be no space there. And so God has already decided this uh, number of people, okay, you will be saved. All the rest, forget about it. 
That's why they are not preaching. That's why they are not making efforts. They say God will save whoever I will save. They say God is great. They say God is mighty. They say if anybody is to be saved, God knows them. Even if I don't do it, God will go to them. God will point to them. God will save them one way or the other. No, he's not. He has given you the responsibility. And he's saying he's not willing that any shall perish. I talk to somebody and for the first time he shows me. He says, go apart. He said, get away from me. He said, I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me that. Born again, born again. Don't tell me that. And then you say, that person cannot be saved. That fellow, that one is mad for hellfire. I'm not going to waste my time. You are not wasting your time. Go back to him and tell him again. He will hear. I said he will hear. One day, as you are saying and saying and saying, don't you see, I, I do notice in your yard, when they built, uh, you know, the house and everything, and the cement was there, then there was green, and then the only one drop, it dropped now, dropped now, you pass by, there was no mark, and then another rain dropping and dropping, you pass by, no mark. And then the rain dropping and dropping. One day, that little drop of water, and it's not solid, it's not, it's not stone, it's not a pebble, it's just water. It has made a mark there. Have you noticed that before? Keep on telling them. I said keep on telling them. Little drops of water make a mighty ocean. And it's going to make a mark in the heart of that person. Here he comes, he's going to tell me again. And I just want to remind you, my friend, you must be born again. If you die without Jesus Christ, you die like an animal. They roast you in the fire. The only difference is that that fire will continue forever and ever. Don't tell me that. Then you go. Then you see the second day. Good morning. How are you? Did you have you done what I told you? You must be born again. I'm not a good friend if I didn't tell you that you must be born again. You have started again. Then you stop. And then another week you see him again and he knows what you are going to say. Good morning. What's the next thing? You must be born again. Okay. Tell me, how do I do it? Turn away from your sin. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Can I do it here? God is everywhere. And because his presence, you can hear our prayers. You mean I can get saved? Yes, right here. You can get saved. The greatest apostle got saved on the road. Paul, the apostle, did not get saved in the church building or the crusade field. Jaws on the road. In that same way, you can get saved and you'll get saved today. You will lead them to the Lord. I said you lead them to the Lord. But the message must be constant. Tell me point number three. The irreproachable models of soul winning evangelists. Which models can we point to? The people that actually evangelized and they were effective and they did the work like, uh, you know, if we do the work like them today, we will succeed. I'm looking at a successful person there. You will succeed in Jesus' name. I want you to write, I want you to write the word evangelist, you know, write it vertically down. That is E V A N G E L I S T Evangelist. Evangelist. You see, there are models in the Bible that show us how evangelists ought to preach. How you as an evangelist soul winner today, how you ought to preach. E for Ezekiel. Ezekiel. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. That's evangelist. Hear the watch from the mouth of the Lord. What did he tell us to tell them? What did he tell them when he was here? He said, except thou repent, thou shalt surely perish. And except you believe on me, you cannot see life. You cannot have eternal life. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not is condemned already. He had the watch at his mouth and give them warning from him. And Ezekiel was a model of evangelism. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel Ezekiel chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, it says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, tell me, 
it shall die. That's the message of the evangelist. That is, if they continue in their sin, at the end of the road of sinning, they will die. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, it's telling us in verse 30, it says, Therefore, I will judge your house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves. That's the evangelist. That's the evangelist. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions. Whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies. That's the message of the evangelist. And effectively, evangelist, a soul winning evangelist, a person, a fruitful evangelist. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the way of, the, of him that died, says the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live ye, you will have eternal life. V is the voice in the wilderness, the voice in the wilderness, that's John, that's John. You see John, uh, when he went to him and said, who are you? What, are we, what answer are we going to give to the people that sent to us? He said, go tell them, I'm a voice. I'm a voice. In the voice crying in the wilderness. We're looking at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse 22. John chapter 1 verse 22. Then said they unto him, who art thou? And, and that we may give an answer to them that sent us, what says thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice. I am the voice. The voice of prophecy. I am the voice. The voice of promise. I am the voice. The voice that is warning Israel to turn away from sin and turn to the Lord. I am the voice crying of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight in the way of the in the way of the Lord, says the prophet Isaiah. You know, he told the people to repent in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Let's hear the voice now. I am the voice. The voice crying in the wilderness. I'm looking at uh, Matthew chapter 3 we're reading it from verse 7 in verse 7 it says uh, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism he said unto them O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. That's evangelism when you're warning the people. And when you tell them at the end of the life of sinning, there's going to be judgment. And if they're not going to be judged by the mighty power of the Lord and by the faithful, righteous judge of heaven and earth, they must repent today. That's the evangelist. The evangelist like Ezekiel is warning the people, bringing them to the Lord. And the evangelist like the voice in the wilderness. A, the evangelist like Apollos. Apollos. These are people that know the scriptures and when they speak they speak convincingly concerning Christ the Savior. There will be no doubt in the heart of anyone when Apollo stands up and then he preaches the word of Christ and says Christ is the Savior. And Christ is the one. Their minds will not be here and there. Any other Savior, any other Redeemer, any other one that can bring me remission of sin. No. There's no other name. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18 and we're reading from verse 24. Acts of the Apostles chapter 18. And I read here from verse 24. In verse 24 he tells us, he gives us the name of the person. It says, and a certain Jew named Apollos born at, at Alexandria an eloquent man and a mighty and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. Wait there for a moment. You see sometimes uh, if you are in a church, well, there's no excuse for us to preach any poor message. But have you noticed, have you thought about it? In the church, we can get away with a poor message. Because those are members of the church. They will come again. They will come again. Because they are always there. They are faithful members of the church. They are there because, you know, they have to serve. They are there because they have to sing. They are there because they have to organize the church. They are there because they have to do a lot of things. Therefore, whether we preach good or we don't preach good, Maybe they will still come. But when you go to the world, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You have to be effective. 
And you have to talk to them in a way they understand. The thing that will grip them. The thing that will arrest their attention. And the thing that will make them not to have a way of escape. And this uh, person, an evangelist, Apollos, were told he was an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. And then he came to Ephesus. Look at verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews. Not only just convinced them, mightily effectively, powerfully, in a way they could not escape. He mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. That's our only savior. There's no other savior any other place. And therefore, you want to develop yourself to preach and to speak convincingly like Apollos and for Nathan. And for Nathan. We're coming to second, uh, second Samuel chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12. Basically, an evangelist is talking to a sinner. And the evangelist, when you are talking to a sinner, if you tell the sinner, there are sinners in the world. Oh, yes, I know that. I know that. You know, all these people are reading about them in the papers. And, you know, they're corrupt. They steal our money. They do this and that. Anybody will agree with you. There are sinners in the world. There are wicked people in the world. Yeah, of course, I know that. In fact, you know, something they did to my daddy, they did to my mommy. My daddy should not have died now, but you know, wicked people. And then you say there are drunkards the smokers. Of course, of course he is. It is the evangelist that will bring the message home. It's not just that they are sinners, but you, the one I'm talking to, you are a sinner. That's an evangelist. Look at uh, chapter 12. Chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12, and we're looking at it from verse 7. Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. And Nathan said unto David, tell me, Thou art the man. Are you an evangelist? Not somebody looking down and is not willing to look at the face of David and is saying, Thou art the man. He looked at him eyeball to eyeball. He said, I'm talking to you. Look at what we have done. See the story I told you. An evangelist is a good storyteller. It's a person that can take an illustration and then zero it in and he says, Thou art the man. That's an evangelist. An evangelist is a person like Ezekiel. It's a person like the voice in the wilderness. It's a person like Apollos. And it's a person like Nathan that says, Thou art the man. And then he said, Thus, thus have you done? And look at verse 13 here now. In verse 13, see what happened? In verse 13 it says, And, uh, and David said uh, unto Nathan, What did he say? I have sinned. I've sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. And then he led him and he prayed the sinner's prayer and eventually got saved. And Nathan said, the Lord has put away the sinner. Thou shalt not die. That's the evangelist right there. And G is for Gabriel. G is for Gabriel. And we're looking at Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading here from verse 15. We're saying that this is a model. This is how evangelists comport themselves. And this is how evangelists actually present the message. It tells us in uh, Daniel chapter 8. Chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 15. Daniel chapter Eight and reading from verse 15 here is saying and it came to pass uh, when I even I Daniel had seen the vision and sought for the meaning then behold there stood before me the appearance of a man and I had the voice a man's voice between the banks of Eli uh, which called and, and said Gabriel make this man understand the vision. So, this Gabriel came near where I stood and when he came I was afraid and fell upon my face and uh, but he said unto me understand, O son of man for at the time of the end shall be the vision. You see, sinners read the Bible too. It's not only believers that read the Bible. 
Sometimes sinners read the Bible. Like the eunuch of Ethiopia that read, read the Bible. And then he was reading the Bible. It was really about salvation, about Christ, about Jesus, about the Savior. And he didn't understand. And then you find this Philip coming to him and saying, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I understand? Except some man should guide me. And here Gabriel came to Daniel. He had been reading the scriptures. He had been reading about the vision and what will happen. He didn't understand. And then the man said, Gabriel, make this man to understand. He's the evangelist that make this sinner to understand. Make this woman to understand the way to life eternal and the way we can be saved. And so the evangelist is like that giving us understanding. You remember I said this same Gabriel that came to Mary and said hail Mary and then you are blessed of all women and gave the message of the Savior being born into the world. He is for Elijah. He is for Elijah. We're coming to uh, First Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 21. First Kings chapter 18. And we're reading from verse 21. The evangelist must get people out of their halting position. Out of their double-mindedness. And make sure that it's not just either idol or Jesus. Either my good works or what Jesus Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. We must come to a decision. That this is the way and this is the only way. We're looking at First Kings chapter 18 and I'm reading from verse 21. Verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold she between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You see many sinners are double-minded. They go to church, they pay their dues, then they still go and worship idols during the week. And then you are confronting them. You say, I want to talk to you seriously about a matter you must think about before you die. And you can die anytime. Tell me. I know you go to church. I know you pay pastor's deal. I know you observe Christmas. I know you observe Easter. I know you observe this and that. Tell me, if you died right now, do you think you'll get to heaven? I say, maybe I will get to heaven. What's, what's your ground? What's your reason? How do you know you will get to heaven? And they give you this reason, you knock it off. Give you that reason, you knock it off. And they will say, come to a decision. If this God is a wise God who has sent his only begotten son, if there's another way to be saved, he wouldn't have sent his only begotten son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. The very fact that he sent Jesus, his only son, only begotten son, to die for you on the cross of Calvary means that there is no other way and all that way that we are taking in is not going to land you in salvation. It will land you in hell fire. And eventually you begin to understand that this is God is not the right thing. Say the Lord he is God. Look at verse 36. In verse 36, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I, ha I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things according to thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that thou art the God, that the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. That's the message. Turn their hearts back again. That's repentance. Turn their hearts back again. Away from idol. Away from Baal worship. And unto the God of heaven. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the bond sacrifice and the wood and the, and the stone and the dust and licked the waters and in, in the trench. In the waters that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, when you preach, they will see something. Fire will come from heaven. Power will come from heaven. The sick will be healed and the oppressed will be delivered. They'll see something. When the people saw, when all the people saw each, uh, they fell on their faces and they said, what did they say? The Lord, he is the God. The Lord is the God. And that is convincing evangelists. L is for Luke. 
El is for look. You see, there are people that, uh, that reach these highly placed people. And there are people that reach all these, uh, you know, sophisticated people, all these political leaders, political powers. There are people that can reach them. And we have to reach them. We have to talk to them. Somebody has to rise up and go and talk to them. Because we're to reach all the creatures, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Let's look at Luke. We're looking at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set in order. A declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they have declared them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. It seemed good unto me also, having, uh, having that perfect understanding of all things, and from the very first, uh, from the very first, to, to write unto thee in order. Tell me the name there. Most excellent Theophilus. Go to their palace in a wonderful, in a humble way and go and tell them. And go to those offices and go and tell them the most excellent Theophilus and, uh, you know, Mr. So-and-so, Madam So-and-so and the people that have the great offices and the Lord behind those offices. Somebody has to know how to knock at that door, how to open that door and like you go to tell the most excellent Theophilus that thou mightest know the certain of those things uh, wherein uh, thou hast been uh, instructed. We're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. After this man gave his life to the Lord, Luke kept writing, Luke kept writing, and wrote about the history of how Christ came, how Christ has saved us, how Christ sacrificed, and everything that Christ did. And now, after Christ went to heaven, he wrote the Acts of the Apostles to these same Theophilus. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, Acts of the Apostles, and the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began but to do and teach. And so you understand what we need to do if we're going to do the work of the evangelist. I is for Isaiah. I is for Isaiah. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm reading here from verse 7. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, and thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. That man was saved, that man was sanctified. And then after that sanctification also I had the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And uh, then said I, everybody you say this together, one, two, three, go. Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And the Lord sent him to go talk to the nation and to talk to them about how their sins can be forgiven, how they can be saved, how they can have assurance of salvation. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 55. And we're reading from verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. That's the evangelist right there. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And call ye upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And your righteous man is thus. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. And S is for Stephen. S is for Stephen. We're looking at Acts of, Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 6 verse 8. We're reading from verse uh, chapter 6 verse 8 of Acts. And Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people must add the miracle ministry. Miracle ministry. Because Jesus said, As he go preach the kingdom of God, heal the sick, and raise the dead, and cleanse the lepers. And he says, Freely you have received, and freely give. As we give them the gospel, we're talking about the power, the power of Christ to save, and the power of Christ to heal, and the power of Christ to deliver. And we say that Jesus Christ is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he did in days gone by, he's still able to do today because God says I am God I change not and the power of God has not changed and as we proclaim the Lord who saves and the Lord who heals we'll find that through you people are going to be saved 
and through you people are going to be healed and they'll be delivered in Jesus name look at uh, verse 10 here in verse 10 it says in verse 10 and they that and and, when, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he speak they were not able to resist the wisdom by which he spake. And now we're looking at T for Timothy. T for Timothy. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 5. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. But watch thou in all things. You will watch. Endure affliction. You will endure. Do the work of an evangelist. That's what you're going to do from today. And this work will prosper in your hand. You're going to speak to sinners, and those sinners, they're going to respond, and they're going to repent in Jesus' name. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. The Lord has called you. And this calling will be effective. And as you go, you go with a mission. As you go, you go with a message. As you go, you go with the model before you. Understanding there is an Ezekiel. There was an Ezekiel at that time. I'm the Ezekiel today. There was a voice speaking in the wilderness at that time. I'm that voice in my community today. There was an Apollos, and I'm going to be that Apollos here today. There was a Nathan. I'm going to be like Nathan. There was an angel Gabriel, and that quality of angel Gabriel, making people to understand the way of the Lord. I'm going to have that in Jesus' name. Here comes Elijah. I will sing, give us another Elijah today. Somebody there, another Elijah today. I said somebody there, another Elijah today. And then you tell them what you hold in between two opinions. If idols be the same, then serve idols. But look at what idols have been doing for you. But if Jesus, our Savior, he if Jesus, our healer, if Jesus, our redeemer, then follow him. And multitudes through you will follow Jesus in his name. And then you'll be like Luke, you'll be like Isa, like Stephen, and like Timothy. If we're going to be the evangelist the Lord has called us to be, and we're going to be, number one, you will have the faithfulness of Ezekiel. The faithfulness of Ezekiel. Hear the word from my mouth and go and give them warning from me. Number two, you have the fearlessness of the voice crying in the wilderness. The fearlessness of John the Baptist. The faithfulness of Ezekiel. The fearlessness of the voice crying in the wilderness. You'll have the fervency of Apollos. The fervency of Apollos. You'll be speaking with passion and with all your heart and with all your strength and all your energy. You have the fervency of Apollos. You'll have the frankness of Nathan. The frankness of Nathan. Telling David and telling the sinner, you're not missing words, you're not pointing here and there. You're saying, thou art the man. You'll be frank with them. You'll have the freshness of Gabriel. You're just coming from the presence of God. You pray through, and then you have the freshness of the spirit. You have the freshness of Gabriel. And then you have the firmness of Elijah. The firmness of Elijah. No compromise. And then you say the God that brings the fire. The God that brings the revival. The God that brings the healing. The God that brings the deliverance. Let him be our God. And then when you pray, you are firm. You say God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. Let the people know that you have sent me. And that I have spoken your word in the very truth. And the fire will come. But you must have the friendliness of Luke. The friendliness of Luke, so friendly to uh, the, uh, to this most excellent Theophilus, he was able to write to him, able to communicate the word unto him. It was a non-threatening personality. That Luke, Luke the doctor, he knew the psychology of communication, he knew the effectiveness of communication, and he used that advantageously. The friendliness of Luke, you'll have the forthrightness of Isaiah. The forthrightness of Isaiah. All your, all your moons and all your sacrifices are nothing. Don't bring vain oblation before me. I'm tired of them. But today you can come. Let us reason together. If your sins be as scarlet, he'll make them as white as snow. And if they be red like crimson, he'll make you as wool. Well. And whosoever he that is willing and obedient shall eat the good of them. But he that refuses shall be slain with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord are said it. Come now, come now, come now. Let us reason together. 
salvation is here. You'll have the forthrightness of Isaiah. You'll have the fullness of Stephen. The fullness of Stephen. It was full of the spirit of God. It was full of power. It was full of faith. It was full of wisdom. And he declared the word without fear, without favor. You'll have the fruitfulness of Timothy. Fruitfulness of Timothy. You'll be fruitful. From this day, if you have not experienced fruit before, the period of fruit had now come in your life. Go and do the work of an evangelist. Go and be fruitful. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up now and let's talk to the Lord in prayer. We'll find the message of the evangelist. And the Lord is sending you. Go and preach. Arise. Go. And preach. Do it. The Lord will go with you.